Hello, my name is Susan Fishbein, and I am the facilitator of the HSS Myositis Support Group. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us as we celebrate Myositis Awareness Month, which is actually in May, but we're celebrating it the first week of June. We are here to honor people who are living with myositis and their families and loved ones. This program is made possible through the collaboration of the Department of Social Work Programs and the Division of Rheumatology at HSS. We are now celebrating the 26th anniversary of the HSS Myositis Support Group, and I have had the honor and privilege to be facilitating this group for the past 15 years. We are dedicated to offering support and education for people with myositis and their loved ones, and to provide a sense of community for people with this rare illness. Even during the difficult times of the pandemic, we were able to come together and stay connected through our monthly support meetings on Zoom, which many of us have learned to manage even when we thought we were technologically challenged and unable to do this. Uh, so here's a brief history of how we came to be the only myositis support group in this area. Together with the Division of Rheumatology, the Department of Social Work Programs developed this group under the advice of Dr. Kagan, who became the first uh, medical advisor for the group. And we've been meeting since 1997. We began with six founding members and it was led by a social work student intern. The group ended with her academic year, but because group members felt it was so important to have a place for people with this rare illness to feel like a community, their voices were heard loud and clear in advocating for this group to continue and continue it did. Now we have over 200 members. In addition to offering support and education for people with myositis and their loved ones, we are committed to raising awareness for myositis. We want to see a time when myositis is considered as a possible diagnosis so that treatment may begin sooner. One way that we do this is by presenting monthly programs that include expert speakers. Topics are chosen through feedback from members and suggestions that are raised during group meetings. Several of our programs are now available on HSS YouTube channel, as this program will also be. This becomes a valuable resource for people seeking help with myositis, and especially for those who may have limited access to care and treatment. Now about today's program. Dr. David Fernandez, our group's esteemed medical advisor and physician to many people with myositis here at HSS, will present on updates in myositis research and treatment. Dr. Fernandez is an assistant professor of rheumatology at Hospital for Special Surgery with a focus on the care of myositis patients, as well as translational research centered on inclusion body myositis. He completed his MD and PhD training at SUNY Upstate Medical, Center, Medical University in Syracuse, New York, before coming to New York City for an internal medicine residency at Weill Cornell Medicine and a rheumatology fellowship at Hospital for Special Surgery. His current research with colleagues at HSS is focused on single cell RNA sequencing of CD8 positive T cells from blood and muscle of inclusion body myositis patients. He has been a site investigator for several myositis clinical trials at HSS, some of which are currently ongoing, and he is interested in collaborating in clinical and translational research efforts. Dr. Fernandez, will speak for approximately one hour. What questions will that may, may be entered through the chat box or in the Q&A option 
that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it appears on the top and they'll be addressed at the end of the presentation when the recording will be stopped. Your thoughts and opinions matter to us. I will be sending a link through email for a survey for you to complete. This should take only a few minutes. The survey is anonymous. It gives us information about how to develop programs that address needs and issues that you find most relevant and also gives our speakers feedback on their programs. Words cannot truly express the gratitude and thanks we feel to Dr. Fernandez. His dedication, caring, compassion, and vast knowledge have helped so many people with myositis. I'd also like to give special thanks to Mr. Demisvar Destin, who is recording for us today, for his help in, in making this presentation possible. And many thanks finally to you, our members and friends and family for joining us today. Without further delay, I'd like to present our guest speaker, Dr. David Fernandez. All right, well, thanks so much, Susan, for that very kind introduction. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I always look forward to this. Uh, it gives me opportunity to to go through the, the past year's research in, in detail. And I often come up and you know, discover things that, that I hadn't seen um, at meetings or hadn't been highlighted. And I think that um, you know, that goes to show some of the, the breadth and, um, and depth of research that's going on in myositis. So, um, all right, so I'll just jump right in. So I'll talk about a number of areas in, in myositis. So I'm gonna talk about some updates in the epidemiology of myositis or the, you know, how large populations of patients are diagnosed and, um, you know, how the disease behaves over time. Um, I wanted to speak briefly about disease monitoring in myositis, uh, exercise in myositis, as well as uh, updates and treatment of polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and inclusion body myositis. And there's really quite a lot uh, to touch on there uh, this year. All right. So I always like to start this talk with just a, an overview of the volume of research that is going on in myositis. And every time I do one of these, the, the number changes and grows. And, uh, and you can see that it's actually, and the slope is changing too. So it's, it's accelerating. Um, there were 14, over 1400 unique results added to the literature in 2022. And, uh, and you can see when I started in 2016, we were down at around 800. Um, so it's nearly double that on an annual basis since, since I've been doing this. And so that I think is, is, pretty, is pretty exciting. All right. And so, um, all right, so I, I wanna touch on this. I had mentioned this uh, last year, but I think it's really important um, because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that are, that are changing and the US population and that that will have implications for uh, the diseases that affect the people in America. And, you know, there've been a lot of, changes to the, you know, to what we think of as the total number of inclusion body myositis patients. So there were some issues with this historically. So one had to do with just difficulty diagnosing the condition and understanding of what features to identify in biopsy and how to, how to pick those up. And, and related to that, there wasn't even a separate diagnostic code. So if you're using large databases to try to identify patients, to get a big sense of, you know, a, sort of an eagle's eye view of the, the disease in the whole country, that wasn't really possible prior to 2010. So there had to be, you had to use other data sets. So, um, so there was uh, this, and there've been a, a couple of smaller data sets. So one was using uh, a population in Sweden um, and they could compare uh, cases that they had identified there. And then in Rochester, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is, there's a very robust way of tracking myositis cases and just diseases in general. 
And so they were able to look back at their cohort over time and see how things have changed. And so what each of them saw was that um, there was an increase relative to the previous decade. So they're capturing many more cases of inclusion body myositis. And it's not clear, there's some of that that is improved diagnosis and some of that is there are more numbers of people who are affected. Um, and this is felt to be, um, so, so they, they estimate that the total number of cases of inclusion body myositis is about uh, 20,000 patients in the United States. And then, you know, as the population ages, as there are more uh, people who are over 50 years old, that is projected to rise further. So by 2060, uh, they project that 30,000 cases will be um, identified in the United States. So things are changing and, and it shows that this is, a, this is an important area of research that needs further attention and, and better treatments. Um, this was a, an interesting paper that had come up focusing on trends in polymyositis and dermatomyositis showing increased survival uh, in patients with um, polymyositis and dermatomyositis. And the way that this was done was uh, it was an analysis of death certificates in the United States from the National Center for Health Certificate uh, Statistics. And they looked at the, you know, the overall number of death certificates that mentioned dermatomyositis or polymyositis. They did this in a few different ways. Um, but um, either way, they found that there were a significantly larger number of deaths per million people uh, that were categorized as being related to dermatomyositis or polymyositis starting in the 1980s where they had data, and that that declined pretty steadily over this period. So it's about a 30% decline um, over this period. And interestingly, the, the rate was a somewhat higher in female patients relative to male patients uh, for reasons that the authors were not clear on. Um, this effect was even greater in polymyositis. So there's a drop by almost two thirds um, in, the, in the mortality that was identified there. Um, it's true that life expectancy improved in the United States in general over this time period, but this is still a pretty big and positive change that should be celebrated. All right, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, disease monitoring in myositis and just to plug our resources here. We're very fortunate at HSS to have lots of um, talented and capable colleagues and the, the field of quantitative strength testing has really expanded quite a lot in the last um, you know, couple of decades. And um, you know, the strength testing in the office has a lot of upsides. You, know, it's very, um, you can get a lot of information from it, but it is somewhat imprecise and requires a lot of training in order to, to be able to do it reliably and to discern you know, the maximum amount of information that you can from it. And so, so I, I depend a lot on my colleagues at the Motion Analysis Lab at HSS to do a formal assessment of strength using uh, dynamometers, machines that can measure the torques or force that the, um, that the limbs can exert in different positions. And these are increasingly included in clinical trials and uh, among the clinical trials that we're participating in, many of them in include that. And so, so we have to test that as part of the assessment. And there's other kind of nice values to that. So one is that you can compare strength to the general population, to what would be expected based on age and height. Um, and, and I find that it's particularly useful for establishing a baseline and then looking at treatment changes over time. Um, this was a study that had come out um, that I, I mentioned last year, but I wanna highlight it because I think it really shows the, the potential of this, um, this type of measurement. And so this group um, in Pittsburgh had studied handheld dynamometry, which is a device that looks like this. So it's got a little uh, you know, pressure pad and then a hand grip, and that you're able to just sort of press in the same way that you would press down on arms or legs when you're doing the strength testing. You can do that just with this device and then it sends a signal to a receiver that gives you an output in pounds or kilograms. 
And um, so as you can imagine, that's somewhat more precise than kind of a you know, general gestalt that you get from, from pressing. And so what they did was they made a combination score of looking at the deltoids, the shoulders, and the hip flexors, you know, sort of bending up at the, at the hips when in a seated position, and they averaged those values together. And they found that those scores were reliable so that um, they could get similar results if they repeated the testing. Um, it wasn't, you know, prone to lots of variation. And it was valid. So it meant that it, you know, it fit with the overall clinical impression and with other measures of disease activity and severity. And then importantly, if you look here um, on the, the diagram on the right, they show that there's less of a ceiling effect. So if you look at the MMT score, that's the kind of the clinical gestalt testing. You can see that somebody who is inactive has, you know, generally very good uh, muscle strength, but it's all kind of clumped together. It's hard to differentiate those patients from each other. Whereas if you look at the handheld dynamometry, you can get a nice spread. So you can see on average, the people who are inactive are better than the people who are active, but you can see you know, exactly who's doing better and who's doing worse and, and identify subtle gradation, subtle differences between those groups of patients. And that, that helps to pick up on subtle things that um, you can pick up flares sooner. You can, you know, you can verify, you can have greater trust in your exam and know exactly how much uh, strength you're, you're capturing and what you're not, and, and be able to intervene sooner when, and with more confidence um, in patients who, who need to, to change treatment. All right. Um, this is something I touch on every year because I think it's really important, and I believe that it, uh, it's an issue that is you know, particularly burning or pressing for patients who are newly diagnosed. But I want to speak about uh, dermatomyositis and the association with cancer risk. And um, there's a number of ways that we assess myositis patients, but one of the, the critical ways is we um, increasingly there have been many autoantibodies um, that are blood tests that we do in myositis patients that help us identify groups of myositis patients that tend to behave a certain way, that tend to have common manifestations and sort of cluster together. And one of those patterns is an association with cancer. So these two antibodies, TIF1 gamma, it's also called P155-140, and NXP2, which is also called MJ, um, have been shown to be associated with cancer. And interestingly, um, there are some studies that have shown that there are, if you look at tumors from patients who have these autoantibodies, there are mutations that can be identified or signals that mutations were present at some point in the tumors of patients, indicating that the disease in that instance represents an effort by the immune system to target and suppress or eliminate the tumor. And uh, you know the clinical things that we are treating with medicines are sort of the collateral damage in that fight. So, so it's important because these, these antibodies identify a high-risk group of patients that would benefit from more intensive screening and more attention. At the same time, I really want to highlight that the, you know, the, the antibody test does not equal a diagnosis of cancer. So on the one hand, those patients are at higher risk and need to be looked at closely. On the other hand, only a fraction of the patients who have those antibodies will have cancer. So about 20% uh, in, of the TIF1 or the NXP2 patients will, will be diagnosed with cancer. Um, and that furthermore, the risk of cancer is related to the time of diagnosis. So uh, it's related to a cancer that is present and being fought actively by the, the immune system. And so as time passes, the likelihood that a cancer will become evident that's related to the myositis and is driving the myositis gets less and less likely. Um, it's important to know that there's an impact of age. Um, so there's no risk of malignancy in uh, children with juvenile dermatomyositis. 
and the risk is less in younger adults than in older adults. Um, and interestingly, this year, there are other autoantibodies that can be present at the same time as the TIF1 gamma. And so David Fiorentino's group at Stanford um, identified a couple of additional antibodies in conjunction with colleagues at Johns Hopkins that were associated with a lower risk of cancer. And so that's these two ones, the CCAR1 and the SP4. And both of these um, can be present in addition to the TIF1 gamma. And it seems that the more antibodies that are present reflects the, a broader and more effective anti-cancer response potentially. And so no, so those aren't commercially available yet, but they may be in the future and that would be helpful in deciding who to, to look for cancer. The other thing that's happened uh, in the past year is that formal recommendations for cancer screening were issued by the American College of Rheumatology and, uh, and its European analog. And uh, these were promoted by the International Myositis Assessment and Clinical Studies Group. And basically the way that they work is they sort patients into different risk groups and then base the screening on those risk factors. So an example of a low risk patient, um, patients who are less likely to have cancers are those patients who have interstitial lung disease, the inflammation of the lung that you can see in myositis patients. Um, those who have certain autoantibodies like the JO1 or antisynthetase antibodies, the SRP antibodies, and those who have overlap disease with um, scleroderma or lupus or some other, um, some other connective tissue disease. Those patients are less likely to have cancers driving their dermatomyositis. And the examples of high-risk patients are those with uh, classic manifestations of dermatomyositis, particularly when it's very severe uh, at the time of onset. And then I mentioned these other antibodies, the TIF1 gamma and NXP2. So, um, and so they, yeah, then they, they sort it so that if you are at low risk, you get just sort of a, a basic screening and you stay up to date with age appropriate testing and high risk screening, you get more intensive um, testing. And so these are the things that they recommend. So the basic screening is honestly not fundamentally all that different from general clinical care. Um, there's a couple of extra blood tests that are run. They recommend doing an x-ray and they really just emphasize completing age-appropriate cancer screening. And, um, and then if there are new symptoms, then you do other testing based on that. And the people who are at higher risk, there's a wider set of tests that are recommended. So they recommend uh, CT scans. They recommend doing pap testing for cervical cancer screening, mammography. There are certain blood tests that you can do to look for tumors. So the PSA or prostate-specific antigen and another one called the CA125 um, are recommended. A specific ultrasound can be useful in identifying early ovarian cancer and stool testing looking for blood. They don't formally recommend a colonoscopy, but um, that is also reasonable and is often applicable to most patients. They mentioned considering uh, something called a PET CT, which is used in the diagnosis and monitoring of patients with um, certain types of cancers that looks at the whole body at one shot. And um, so that, that is another option and it's being evaluated in other studies. Um, and this, you know, I think it, it is helpful because people had very different ways of approaching this and either more open-ended, you know, that they would do screening kind of indefinitely looking for cancers that, you know, would grow less and less likely or maybe weren't indicated based on the, the type of dermatomyositis that was present um, or, you know, were potentially missing things that were early or, or treatable in the, in the disease process. All right. So, Moving on to exercise and the treatment of myositis. 
Um, again, this is another thing that, that I harp on every year, but I think it's really important. It's very important. And um, I just want to be clear so that patients uh, hear it uh, multiple times. So I think that the exercise or physical therapy is important in all forms of myositis. And it's a little counterintuitive um, because, you know, people have a sense that when you exercise, you create sort of strain or microscopic injury to muscle and the muscle repairs itself. And it's that process that allows for muscle regeneration and building strength and endurance. Um, so if your muscles are, are already injured by the immune system, wouldn't this be just an added stress? Wouldn't that be dangerous? And um, I could say that there's a, a rationale for that, but this has been tested. It's been tested a lot of times and there's no sign of increased risk of flares or worsening of disease with exercise. So the studies have shown that physical therapy is safe at almost essentially any stage of disease activity. And then it just has to be within reason, you know? So you're not aiming for some specific level of performance, you're aiming for incrementally better. And then you build on that and build on that and build on that. And then that helps to improve strength, improve physical function, improve uh, you know, the ability to do the typical activities of daily living and to uh, limit the, you know, the impact on muscle that comes from treatment, like with steroids. Um, other studies have shown even a benefit on the molecular level so that uh, patients who underwent uh, an endurance training program with uh, cycling um, on a stationary bicycle had shown improved endurance and then you know, molecular markers of, the, of inflammation on repeat muscle biopsy showed less inflammation on those tests. There was less lactic acid, there was less uh, inflammatory proteins. So specific types of exercise are being evaluated in ongoing studies. So I, I'll highlight this because I think it's a, a good example. I did touch on it before, but I, again, I think it just makes it very clear um, so this was uh, targeted physical therapy intervention, looking at um, trying to improve activities of daily living and stability. So they had 57 patients who were enrolled and the patients got either uh, physical therapy sessions twice a week for, um, for six months or just standard care and um, without specific guidance on therapy. And then there was a blinded evaluation it meant that the, the doctor who was doing the strength testing didn't know what the patients got. They didn't speak before that assessment. And they saw a really dramatic improvement, both in strength. This is the MMTA, the typical testing in the office um, over time. So you see this really big difference here in the patients who, were, who got the physical therapy versus the ones who didn't. And then the FI2 is a test of repeated movements to give a sense of endurance. And that got really much better in the patients who received the intervention versus those who didn't. Um, they also saw the patients felt better, they had better moods. So I think um, it's, it's like an unalloyed benefit that, uh, and it's critical for, for maintenance of, of strength in, um, in all forms of myositis. All right. So I want to spend some time speaking about uh, treatments of polymyositis and dermatomyositis. And I'll start, um, you know, there were some studies that, um, that use different types of agents. And so this one I think is interesting because it is more of a, a nutritional supplement. And it's a, a question that comes up often in, um, in treatment which is, you know, are there things that aren't, you know, medicines, aren't prescriptions that, that we could use to, to help manage myositis? And so this was a, an effort to address that kind of question. And so this was a study done in Japan, um, and it used um, a supplement of branched chain amino acids. So that's just a, a subset of the regular amino acids that make up all of the proteins in our body and are present in you know, essentially all foods at, at some level or another. And this is a specific extra supplement of some of them. So isoleucine and valine and leucine. Um, 
those those names may ring a bell or not. And um, and so the reason that this was employed is that if in certain models of muscle injury or muscle atrophy specifically, including the atrophy that comes with immobility or steroid treatment related atrophy, that if you treat animals with branch chain amino acids, you can reduce that the impact of those uh, those models. And, and so the thought was that a patient with myositis would be the optimal um, sort of human subject to, to try this therapy out. And so this was implemented in 47 patients who had active disease. Um, so they had weakness and they were going to get high dose steroids in order to help control their symptoms. And so the patients either got placebo or they got the branch chain amino acids for 12 weeks. And then a subset of all those who started the trial uh, continued in an open label phase for an additional 12 weeks. So then everyone out of the 25 got the, the medicine. And so, you know, unfortunately, there was not a clear and obvious change in strength in this uh, MMT scoring at um, at 12 weeks or at 24 weeks. Um, it was really pretty steady throughout. Um, the way that they did the scoring is sort of, is a, is a little atypical, um, but, you know, I think they, they didn't see a huge difference. Um, they did see some incipient change in endurance. Um, and so this is the, that same FI score. And um, again, this is just looking at a subset of specific motions of the limbs against gravity. So lifting the arms against gravity like this, lifting the legs um, in a seated position, lifting the head and uh, counting the number of repetitions that can be done and then following that over time and uh, it, counting the number of repetitions in a three minute period. So, um, so it, it gives an indication of endurance, which often you know, lags somewhat behind the recovery and strength. And so they saw that there actually was some increase in endurance that was evident in the patients who got this in the black, the, the black circles who got the branch chain amino acids versus the placebo who got the, this is the, the white square line. And so, so it may be that that or something like that may hold some promise in the future. But um, you know, we'll have to see uh, any other further studies. But I think, you know, just a, a final point, I don't think that any of these things would be um, harmful in any way. Like I said, there, there are things that are constituents of food broadly. And so it would be, um, you know, essentially completely safe. All right. One of the, the big Biggest news in this field and in many years was this trial of IVIG and dermatomyositis. And uh, so the formal publication was, um, you know, the paper came out in November of last year. And this, um, so I just want to go through it in some detail because I think that on the one hand, there's, you know, it showed a positive result, which led to FDA approval of IVIG for the treatment of dermatomyositis, which was, um, really a, a huge advance for, um, for patients and for access and for um, kind of the understanding of rheumatologists in the community that it was possible to administer this and exactly how. Um, but there's also some other kind of some more subtle insights that are present as well that I wanna highlight. So this is a phase three study um, and 95%, uh, 95 patients were with active dermatomyositis were enrolled. Patients needed to have active muscle involvement. And while they weren't required to have skin disease, all of them did have skin disease. And 47 received IVIG, and while 48 received placebo for 16 weeks. And then after that, all of the patients got IVIG for an additional 24 weeks. And the outcome was this uh, measure called the total improvement score, which um, has been an advance in trial design that has permitted better assessment of patients over the last several years. 
And uh, they found that there was a big difference between the treatment groups, which fits with our you know, sense of IVIG over the last 20, 30 years, which is that, that it works very well for a large proportion of patients. Um, and they found that 79% of patients on IVIG met the primary outcome versus 44% on placebo. And so that seems kind of a lot for the placebo, but you, you got to remember that the placebo response, you know, these patients, not that they're getting nothing, they're getting, you know, the same therapies that they were getting before. And it's good, you know, there's some incremental additional benefit that you get from those things. Um, so this is one way of looking at the data. So you can see that this is that TIS score. You can go from zero to 100. Um, and you know, most of the patients here probably have the a maximum score of you know, somewhere between 60 and 80. Um, and so they go, the IVIG group very quickly improves. Placebo group, you see some improvement, but it really kind of flattens out. And then when it opens up and they can, everybody's getting IVIG, the placebo group then catches up to the IVIG group by 40 weeks of treatment. So there's a, a pretty substantial improvement um, over this, um, you know, slightly less than a year period. And um, so this is just uh, a table looking at some of the, the disease criteria. And I just wanna highlight one thing in particular I think is, is so important which is that, you know, these are some of the, you know, the sicker patients who have the greatest need for treatment who have not responded. And, um, and so you can see this MMT8 score, the maximum score is uh, 150. So they have a score of 120. So that's really, you know, pretty limited. That's, that's a substantial amount of weakness and limitation. And then the, maybe a little bit easier to wrap your head around are the patient or physician global assessments. So, you can imagine, you know, the the worst possible, you know, dermatomyositis patient that would be a ten, and the the least amount of disease or no disease at all would be a zero. So these patients are somewhere around a six out of ten. They they rate their disease severity on that scale, and um, and you know, if you look at their creatine kinase levels, the CK, which you know, a lot of people use to, to follow the disease activity appropriately, what you'll find is that all the subjects, the average of number that was present in patients enrolled was actually in the normal range. So that the patients who've had disease for a long time, you know, that the, the CK doesn't capture everything. And specifically, it doesn't even identify patients who can't respond to therapy. So that oh, the patients who got IVIG got better over the course of this uh, trial, despite having normal muscle enzymes. And so I think it's it's important for patients to know that not that the muscle enzymes have no import, because the all these patients or the vast majority had elevations of skeletal muscle enzymes at some point, you know, close to a hundred percent, but at the time of trial enrollment, it was normal, and so. You know, just sort of expand on this a little bit. You know, we use a number of different tests to look at the disease activity, but it's important to recognize that these, you know, the tools have uses and they have limitations, and it's important to, to get a sense of that. So the level of elevation of these muscle tests may not reflect the severity of the disease or weakness. Um, in some patients, it does. In others, it doesn't. Um, and not all tests are elevated in all patients. All right, the other important thing to talk about with this trial is relates to side effects. And so IVIG can be associated with important adverse events. So the ones that they saw in this trial um, were headache, which I saw very commonly in, uh, you know, 40% uh, of patients, uh, fevers they saw very commonly, and nausea. And so you can imagine, you know, people who've had IVIG would have a sense of, it would be hard to, you kind of would know if you had the placebo, it'd be hard to do this in a truly blind fashion, but they, they certainly try because um, the, the headache and stuff is, is really very common. And um, they also saw, importantly, they saw clowning events. And, and I think also, um, you know, if you think about the way that this was dosed, 
it was dosed, the standard was that patients got two doses uh, back to back once a month. And then um, if the investigator decided, they could spread that out over five days. So people would get it over five consecutive days once a month. And so, so that's a pretty tight dosing. And um, you know, there's no alternative that was testing, but I think that, you know, from my anecdotal experience, the many of these side effects are related to the size of the dose and the speed at which you give it. So if you give a big dose back to back, that's the highest risk of side effects. And if you give a lower dose and spread it out more, you have a lesser risk. And um, so this, you know, this number of clotting events is actually, you know, it's like a decent number in a uh, in hundred patients over less than a year. And so, um, so that was certainly a cause for concern, a reason to, you know, it's not like a panacea. It's not something that's gonna, you know, work for literally everybody, but it's a very important tool. And now we have this really robust set of um, data that, we, that will help us understand how to implement it and what to look for. But, you know, the clotting risk, again, I wanted to, to follow up on because it, it's just different from the clinical experience in a lot of centers. And so I was, I was heartened to see this additional study that came from the Brigham system um, that was published earlier this year. And so they, the group there um, with uh, Dr. Floigels, um, looked at the patients that they could identify in their system. And they were able to find 458 patients who satisfied the definite classification criteria. And they saw you know, about three quarters were female, a quarter were male, um, about 20% had uh, cancer associated dermatomyositis. And, uh, and importantly, the previous trial, the cancer associated patients did not, were not included. So, and they found that there were 23 clotting events that were seen. And they looked at the group of patients who were on IVIG and the group of patients who were not on IVIG. And they saw that the rates of clotting events were slightly higher among the patients who did not get IVIG. And a lot of the clotting events occurred in the patients who had the cancer associated dermatomyositis. So it's not to diminish the clinical trial data, which is, you know, is more carefully controlled than this kind of study. But, you know, this is still a rare event that's not present most of the time. And there, they did not see a clear association with IVIG treatment and clotting risk. And other factors may be important as well. So just the, the disease itself may be associated with clotting risk, um, immobility from severe weakness, you know, so if you're not moving very much, that allows the blood to pool and makes clots easier to form. Um, smoking is a risk factor. Um, oral contraceptive therapy is a risk factor. And so, so there's other things that could play a role. Um, but certainly we'll be looking at this in more, in more detail in future studies. All right. And then I had highlighted this last year, but I think it's also just an indication it's the best study just giving a sense of the scope of the impact of IVIG in this subset of myositis, the necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. Um, and so this was 19 patients who got um, IVIG. Uh, this was out of Pittsburgh, and they looked at patients before and after initiation of IVIG. So they had 14 who were the HMGCR positive, four who had anti-SRP, and two who had anti-Rho52. And there was a very big decline in muscle enzymes in these patients and a corresponding increase in strength from an MMT8 of 52 over 80 to uh, close to 70 over 80. So that's a, that's a very big change. And that also went along with the decline in the prednisone dose that these patients required. And so that, that is a, a big and important difference going from 30 to 11, that would correspond to much less uh, facial swelling, much less hypertension, much less risk of, um, or it would, it would slow down the, the impact on blood sugars and bone density and, and lots of other things. And so that is a, is a big and important difference as well. All right, 
Now, this uh, was a, was an exciting um, study that was done. It's very preliminary. So, but I just want to expose you to this um, this concept if you haven't heard of it. And so, this is called chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And so, the a chimera or a chimeric protein is one that's made of multiple different proteins, you know, like the chimera of Greek myth um, that is made of, you know, different animals with the, the snake tail and the goat body and the lion head. And, um, and so the way that it works is that um, scientists start take blood from patients and isolate T cells, a specific type of white blood cell. And then they make this chimeric antigen receptor and express it using a virus to put it onto cells. And so they're engineering the cells to target tumor cells. So they make an antibody, you know, that will stick to a specific protein. And then on the inside of the cell, there's the, the T cell receptor to help activate the T cell. And then they expand the cells, they grow millions of these cells, and then they give it back to the patient. And that generates a very strong anti-tumor response. So these cells bind to cancer cells or the target cells and kill them. And then over time, those cells dwindle, um, maybe over a period of a few months. And um, this kind of treatment, while it seems very um, complicated and difficult, um, is FDA approved to treat a variety of leukemias as well as multiple myeloma. And they can't target any, just anything, but the things that they can successfully target include these two molecules, CD19 or BCMA that are present on specific types of cancer cells or specific types of white blood cells. And um, recently promising results were reported in lupus patients and it generated a lot of excitement and buzz. And, um, but there was a trial in myositis that was published in Lancet earlier this year. And, and I thought that this was really exciting too. So this was a patient who had really resistant, really refractory, hard to treat um, anti-synthetase syndrome. So it's a 41 year old man, he had severe weakness, he had lung inflammation, he had high creatine kinase levels. The MRI showed a lot of muscle swelling. Um, he had Raynaud phenomenon. He tested positive for the anti jo one antibodies, and he had received lots of different treatments prior to this with an inadequate response. So he had been treated with prednisone, with rituximab, with IVIG, with tacrolimus, and cyclophosphamide, which is a type of chemotherapy that's used in, um, in really severe cases of myositis, and really just didn't respond to those things. So he was planned for CAR T cell therapy as part of our research protocol and uh, got this specific type that targets this molecule, CD19, on a type of white blood cell called a B cell. And it's similar to that that, um, that rituximab targets, except it captures a slightly broader set of cells. Um, the way that this works is that you have to pre-treat patients with sort of a, what they call a conditioning regimen so your body can accept the cells. So that you get a sort of moderate chemotherapy treatment beforehand, um, but it's not fundamentally different from like the dose that this patient already got. And so this is what happened. So if you look at the bottom panel, you can see this is when the patient was receiving the different treatments, including rituximab, drixmab, IVIG, tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide. And this creatine kinase, this patient, it does track with the activity. You can see that initially they had a good response, but then they had a lesser response. And then initially they had a secondary response and then a lesser response. And then they were just doing poorly despite all that. So then they got the CAR T cell therapy and then they had a more sustained response. And so this is just some of the other measures that uh, we look at in the disease. So this is a physician global assessment, the patient global assessment, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how are you doing? So 10 and 10, and it comes down to one and one. The MMT goes from 
110 to almost 150. The creatine kinase is normal. The JO1 antibody goes away. There's really a lot of things that, that get better. So the strength gets much better. The lung disease, if you look here, this is at baseline. This is at three months. And so the black is what lungs should look like. They should be full of air as x-rays pass through easily and it looks dark. And white is inflammation. So less white is good. You can see there's a lot less white in the three month here. Um, the MRI here, you can see that there's lots of swelling, all the bright stuff in the muscle here. All these muscles are very bright. That's, that means that there's a lot of water. And then at three months after therapy, you can see that the muscles are very dark appropriately. So that's, that's kind of what they should look like. There's been a, a big improvement. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that it was exciting because sometimes patients are, are really difficult to treat and to have a new kind of intervention that could work for the, the hardest hard cases uh, is really exciting. And at the same time, there were side effects that needed to be managed. So you needed lots of this pretreatment. It's a complicated thing. Um, he did have uh, sort of an infusion reaction that required a special treatment afterwards with this medicine, tocilizumab. And then he needed extra IVIG to replace the antibodies that his own B cells would make otherwise. So it's not, it's not without, it's not a free ride but it, uh, it was very exciting and larger clinical trials are planning, are in the planning preparatory stages and hopefully will begin um, in, the, in the coming years. All right, this um, is a related uh, treatment. So this is daratumumab in MDA5 positive dermatomyositis. So this is a type of dermatomyositis that can have really hard to treat um, skin disease and arthritis, and, and particularly lung disease. So daratumumab is a biologic therapy that removes cells that express this marker, it's called CD38, and that is present on the types of cells that make antibodies called plasma cells, as well as a set of other cells. And they had this patient that was very particularly hard to treat, had a lot of rash and lung disease. And similarly, this patient got treated with lots of different agents with poor response. And you can see here, these are the sequential CAT scans. You can see there's lots of inflammation. So here's the initial one. The lungs are nice and dark. They look exactly the way that they should. And then here, there's lots of white stuff and the lungs are opaque, showing that there's lots of inflammation present. And that's present despite all these treatments. It's there, it's there. And then the patient gets the daratumumab and then the lungs are clear. So the patient did extremely well with this treatment um, and, and continues to do well. So, so that's another exciting thing. This is a, a medicine that's approved for the treatment of multiple myeloma. So it's, you know, it's around and there's safety data. There's a sense of you know, how to use it. And so it, it stands to reason that this is a, an agent that might be employed in, in other forms of myositis. All right, I think in, the, in lieu of time, in light of the time, I'm gonna buzz through this one. This is one that I mentioned a couple of times, looking at a specific type of medicine called uh, tofacitinib, which is uh, called a JAK inhibitor. And this uh, is a medicine that is approved for multiple things, including rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and it has shown significant promise in this small study of patients with dermatomyositis. So you can see that the patients who got it for 12 weeks um, showed pretty substantial benefit. And then that benefit was sustained in the patients who continued to take it. Um, there were some promising signals of potential improvement in calcinosis, but the, the numbers of patients that were, you know, that had that, it was really quite small. So I, I don't want to make any sort of broader claims about it, but it would be nice to have um, other therapies that would work. Um, another agent that has been uh, tested in a couple of small trials uh, is this one called a Premalast. And so this is another drug that's already FDA approved. Uh, it's used in the treatment of uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, as well as um, an autoimmune disease called Bichette's disease. And, um, and so they, you know, 
the things that are nice about it is that it's somewhat less immunosuppressive and requires less blood testing, less monitoring. And, uh, and it's a pill-based medicine, it's convenient. And so they had seen, so in these two trials, one of five patients, one of eight patients, they saw pretty consistent improvement in the skin disease of dermatomyositis that got you know, somewhat better in this group of three patients and more consistently or considerably better in this group of eight patients. Um, a couple of patients had to stop the medicine due to stomach upset, diarrhea, which can happen with this condition, but that it reverses when you stop it. And so this is another, um, you know, it's an, it's, a, it's another agent that could potentially fit into, uh, you know, what to use in somebody with milder disease. What is a, what is an option that we can employ, you know, that doesn't have the same, um, you know, risks um, as some of our other more intensive therapies. All right. And then there's just been a, a tremendous explosion in clinical trials in polymyositis and dermatomyositis and necrotizing myopathy. Um, and so this is just a listing of several of the studies that are ongoing uh, in the United States and in the world. Um, and so the ones that are italicized are ones that we are either a site or, you know, will be in the future. So if you're curious about those, you can certainly um, reach out to the, to the office and we can um, give you more information. But I think that the pace of clinical trials is accelerating. And, and if anything, it's, it's hard to have enough patients to enroll, actually, um, which is, you know, is a problem that needs to be overcome, but it's, you know, it's better than not having any options to offer patients and nothing new on the horizon. All right. And so I'd like to talk briefly about um, inclusion body myositis. And so I'll mention this trial briefly, um, which is looking at serolimus and inclusion body myositis. And so this trial looked at 44 patients with inclusion body, 22 of whom got serolimus, and 22 got placebo for one year. And so they were hoping to see a difference in quadricep strength over um, over the trial period. And, you know, unfortunately they didn't see that difference. There, there was a decline in both the serolimus group and in the placebo group. However, they did see some positive changes. So they saw stable ability to walk, stable breathing and improved function. Uh, and they saw less um, scarring or fat infiltration um, of the muscles on MRI. Um, and so this is being studied in a larger clinical trial that is ongoing. Um, it's being run out of Australia. And then uh, the main clinical site um, in the US is at Kansas. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see some, some results from that. All right. Um, there was a trial um, of testosterone that was done in Australia as well. Um, on inclusion body myositis. And this was following up on a previous study looking at something called oxandrolone, which is an anabolic steroid like testosterone. Um, and that that initial study had shown some improvement in strength in inclusion body myositis, which is really, um, it was a difficult thing. It was not seen commonly in trials. So they wanted to follow up with um, you know, the more commonly available testosterone to see if a similar benefit would be present. And so they had a small number of patients. It was just 14 patients. And the patients were treated with uh, for 12 weeks with either placebo or testosterone. They got 100 milligrams daily. Um, and then they crossed over. The patients who were getting placebo got testosterone and vice versa. Um, and then after that, um, 12 of the subjects continued and everybody got the medicine for another 12 months. So Unfortunately, in, in contrast to what was seen with the oxandrolone study, they did not see a difference in the strength of the quadriceps at the end of the study. Um, so, um, and then, you know, further, it's, again, testosterone, it feels relatively modest in terms of its impact, but it actually does have some, you know, considerable potential for side effects. So there were some that were potentially concerning, you have increased hemoglobin, so the red cells in the blood go up 
and that can increase the risk of uh, blood clots. And then uh, there's an increase in the PSA. Um, so all prostate cancers depend on testosterone to drive themselves to be sustained. And so if you're giving extra testosterone, there's a concern that you could make that worse. And um, so, yeah, so it's something that needs to be monitored and, and checked over time if uh, patients are on testosterone. So, um, so that, that I think was a valuable addition to the literature, but you know, somewhat disappointing. Um, I want to mention the, the ABC008 um, trial that was initiated in inclusion body myositis. And so this is a biologic medication that targets a protein called KLRG1 on the surface of certain white blood cells, uh, specifically a type of T cell called the CD8 positive T cells that are present in large numbers in the blood and muscle tissue of most patients with inclusion body myositis, though not all. And treatment with this medication removes cells with that marker. And so the, the thought is that these cells, which don't respond necessarily to, to other medicines, might be specifically removed with the use of this medicine. And, um, and so it's being put into trials. Um, so the, the current trial is a phase two slash three uh, randomized placebo controlled clinical trial. And there's two phases. So the initial phase is small. This is the phase two part um, and it's close to enrollment. 30 patients were enrolled. And if everything goes okay for the first six months, then the larger phase three trial opens up and an additional 201 patients will be enrolled. Uh, the treatment period will last 18 months. And um, yeah, and so, so there's a lot of excitement about this. Um, and we are uh, uh, participating in the trial. So if you're interested in the, the details, you know, please feel free to reach out to the office. All right. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll go through. I know we're, we're running late. So I, I'll speak very briefly. We have a few research efforts at HSS. Uh, so one is uh, myositis registry. We're gathering comprehensive information about myositis patients, uh, doing antibody profiling and formal disease activity measurement, um, and obtaining samples for use in, in lab studies. Um, it's really a minimal commitment, um, but you know, it's quite helpful in, um, you know, in, in building a, a wider understanding of the, the ways that different patients can behave with the disease. And then this is uh, the project that we're focusing on, inclusion body myositis. And so I'm just mentioning the expansion of the, the KLRG1 cells. So the cells that are seen in the muscle of IBM patients are this type of cell, the CD8 T cell. And the cells in the muscle show signs of um, activation or hyperactivation. The cells are large and they have a specific appearance with um, what they call granules. You know, they're these sort of blobs that are present inside the cell. And the and so it showed there was this study by Stephen Greenberg's group in Boston, who is the um, originator of the ABC008 drug, um, that the cells are not just expanded, they're not just more numerous is that they're clonal, they're, they're identical. There's one cell that, that is, has multiplied many, many times. And, um, and so that situation means that they, there's actually, you can make a diagnosis of a slow growing leukemia, something like 50% of IBM patients. And so it's, it's a little, you know, I think that terms are a little loose here, you know, so a lot of patients will have, you know, you can call it whatever, but, you know, patients would never know that there was anything wrong. It's just that they have large numbers of specific types of cells that are present in the bloodstream. And this is the kind of thing that may never necessitate treatment were it not, it's just, and that's why it wasn't evident beforehand. Um, but if we imagine 
if we if we consider for a second that the cells that are present in the muscle may have some features that resemble um, leukemia or leukemia-like cells, that um, it's 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 somewhat easier to understand why perhaps those cells might not respond as readily to therapy with uh, the agents that we typically employ. So, um, so they're they're a, a target that um, you know would be addressed with uh, the ABC drug, and we're trying to understand in the in the lab as well. And so, so we're trying to understand the things that underlie this. Um, and to understand whether, you know, so you know, whether we can show that patients with IBM do have the same population. And so we, we, we find pretty similar results that about half of the patients do have an expansion of these cells. And we're currently in the midst of looking for um, the genes that are turned on and off in these cells and looking for mutations, you know, changes in the DNA that might cause them to behave differently. And then once we have that information, we want to try using medicines in the lab in vitro, you know, on the cells to see um, how that changes their behavior. So, um, so hopefully we'll have more on that soon. But I, I'll just close by saying, you know, I think that this year has shown there's a lot of exciting developments on the horizon. I think the pace of clinical trials is accelerating. And hopefully this is going to bring us closer to the, you know, as Susan said, the, the an era where the disease is more rapidly identified, is more ably and easily assessed, and, uh, and can be cured. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, in the lab, um, the Macro lab, uh, my colleagues in the Donlin lab, uh, my colleagues in the Scleroderma vasculitis and myositis center of excellence at HSS, um, as well as the funders of our research. And with that, and I'd like to thank all of our patients that have helped um, in all of these studies and in the clinical trials and all of today's participants. I'd like to give a particular note of thanks to Susan for all her, her help to both to me and to the patients in the group. I know that, that we all appreciate her very much. So thank you.